Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast, Doing More With Less, Stem Cells Regulate Their Fate by Altering Their Stiffness, presented by Dr. Melika Sarim, Project Leader, Postdoctoral Associate, Biomedical Sciences and Regenerative Technologies, Institute for Macromolecular Chemistry, University of Freiburg, Germany. I'm Christy Jewell of Labyrinth, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is brought to you by Labroots and sponsored by Thermo Fisher Scientific. To learn more about our sponsor, please visit thermofisher.com forward slash cell culture heroes. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the ask a question box and click send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, click on the support tab found at the top right of the presentation window or report your problem by using the ask a question box. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the continuing education credits tab located at the top right of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. I'd now like to introduce our presenter, Dr. Melika Sarem. For a complete biography on Dr. Sarem, please visit the biography tab at the top of your screen. Dr. Sarem, you may now begin your presentation. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining our webinar today. It's a great pleasure to have you all here. My name is Melika Sarem, and I'm a project leader in the University of Freiburg in the Institute for Macromolecular Chemistry and Bio Center for Biological Signaling Studies. Today, I will talk about one of my recent publications, which was published three months ago in a stem cell research and therapy journal. My publication was highlighted in several news agencies with an article entitled, Doing More with Less. Stem cells regulate their fate by altering their stiffness. So if you are interested, let's dive in. One of the biggest motivation of my study is a disease called osteoarthritis. I'm sure that most of you may know someone in your extended family and friend circle who suffers from osteoarthritis. As in the USA alone, 10% of men and 13% of the women aged 60 and older have been diagnosed with knee osteoarthritis. So what is osteoarthritis exactly? It's a degenerative joint disease uh, with, uh, uh, sorry, <laughs> it's a little bit stressful. It's a degenerative joint disease which is characterized by cartilage degeneration and also overgrowth. Cartilage, or better say, articular cartilage, is a white smooth tissue which covers the end of bones in joint. It enables bones of a joint to easily glide over one another with a very little friction. Acting as a cushion between joints, cartilage can help distribute the load of pressure and weight over the surface of joints. It also can serve as a shock absorber, and it's mainly composed of water and collagen. But you know, unfortunately, cartilage has a very limited self-repair and renewal capacity due to its vascular nature. So what are the available solutions or treatment for osteoarthritis? Of course, one of the commonly prescribed medications are painkillers. Painkillers could be temporary solution for elderly people but let's not forget that osteoarthritis does not always happen due to wear and tear. Many young adults are also diagnosed with osteoarthritis stemming from sport injuries, genes, and overweight. Currently, replacement of an articulating joint with a synthetic prosthesis represents the optimal treatment for end-stage joint disease. However, it has its own limitation as apparently even successful implants have failure rate of 20% after 10 to 20 years. So as you see, it cannot work for really young adults. There has been a great interest in developing biological treatment for joint repairs. So what is the next? What can be the next option? One of these potential approaches is tissue engineering, which utilizes cells and biomaterials to regenerate tissues. Tissue engineering is divided to scaffold-based and scaffold-free methodologies. In the scaffold-based technique, cells are harvested from body, expanded in vitro, and later seasoned in scaffolds and cultured in presence of bioactive molecules. 
and implanted in vivo. However, scaffold free recently uh, scaffold free techniques recently such as cell therapy and gene therapy have attracted attention more from scientific community. But you know what is very important here is that regardless of which approach is desirable for cartilage regeneration, one should know the development of process of cartilage to be able to mimic the way nature does it. Because as you know, nature does it really the best. So cartilage is a major process called chondrogenesis. I have divided this process to two stages. The first stage starts with aggregation of mesenchymal stem cells, which starts with the formation of dense cell-cell contacts through adhesion proteins. The initiation of this process, size, boundaries, and differentiation of closely packed mesenchymal stem cells is tied to regulated via transmembrane adhesion proteins, such as n -catherine. Please remember that name because you will hear it quite often in my talk. The process leads to induction of chondrogenic phenotype and is regulated by several factors such as growth factor, hormones, and mechanical forces. In this stage, cell-cell contact plays an important role in transducing the mechanical forces into intra- and extracellular biochemical cues through activation of single signaling pathways. So what is our next step? In this stage two, it starts with progression of chondrogenesis and the position of matrix rich in prostaglycans and collagen type 2. The process of maturation continues, as you can see in the carton which I have drawn. In this state, cells start to make distance from each other and reside in a space that they have created. This space is called lacuna. So you see the cells are separated from each other. The matrix is rich with prostaglycans and collagen type 2. So how we can replicate this process in laboratory settings? Thankfully, there is a very well-established process. Once you have access to mesenchymal stem cells, you can replicate this process in vitro easily. One can obtain mesenchymal stem cells from different sources, such as bone marrow and fat. But the ones we use in our study are from adult bone marrow. And they were kindly, kindly provided from Professor Ivan Martin's laboratory in Uni Hospital Basel. So what do you do? After you isolate the cells, first you have to expand them to have adequate cell number. Then you detach them from flask and make monodispersed solution. And of course, you have to count the cells. Then you make solution of 1 million cells per ml in chondrogenic differentiation media. In this chondrogenic differentiation media, you should include chondroinductive factors. What are they? They are called TGF beta, dexamethasone, ascorbic acid, and etc. But the most and biggest promoter is TGF beta 1. Then you add 500 microliters of this solution in centrifuge tube, centrifuge at 800 RPM for 30 minutes, and you are ready to go. So that means in every small centrifuge tube, you have 500,000 cells. Remember this number because this is a gold standard number with so many laboratories in different, and so many scientists in different laboratories around the globe use it. So you have close the tube to make the uh, oxygen and carbon dioxide diffusion and keep in culture for 21 days. After 21 days, you can cryosection the pellet, visualize the protoglycan in the matrix using histological staining such as algae blue and safranino. As you can see, the process is very easy and very well established. So, in this picture, you see the typical staining algae blue in the pellet. There is one main pellet and another small satellite pellet. Portic lichens are stained in blue, and cells are stained using nuclear plastic in pinkish red. So take a moment and look at this picture very, very carefully. What attracts your attention in this very specific picture? When I looked at this picture, I had a question that why the satellite palette close to the main palette shows a stronger staining for portic lichens, and the morphologically, the chondrocytes are more mature. You can see the formation of lacuna in the satellite small palette. This was the moment I would call it that the Newton's happen really hit my head. And I was thinking, why this is happening? What is the reason behind it? And I had an interesting idea. I thought maybe this is because of differences in the number of the cells within aggregate and palette. Maybe this small satellite palette has a less cell number, so because of that, it's chondrogenically more advanced. So I decided to make pellets with different cell numbers, starting from 700,000 to 500,000. I chose 700,000 as this size pellet or the smallest one that you can easily handle in the lab. 
And 500,000, as I told you before, is a gold standard number that different scientists use. As you see in this beautiful family picture, despite the fact that the pellets with the lowest initial cell number, which I call it from now, the initial cell number is the number of the cells which I put in this little centrifuge tube, which is here, for example, 70,000, has seven times less cells comparison to the cell to the pellet with the highest initial cell number. After seven days, the volumetric size between the pellets is actually differences is negligible. And after 21 days, the diameter of 500,000 pellets is only one and a half times bigger than the 70K pellet. So you see the production of matrix, which actually leads to increase of the size in the pellets is more uh, efficient in 70,000 pellets. So the next step was to take a closer look in the pellets. I want to see if the pellets show almost similar size, but they show different levels of chronogenesis. So I wanted to ex compare the expression of glycans, which as I said, they're a hallmark of chronogenesis. If you take a look at this altium blue stain, you will notice that generally from day seven to day 21, in all the conditions, there is an increase in the intensity of the blue color. And in the both time points with decreasing the initial cell number, Palettes show a stronger expression of protoglycans and chondrocytes are looking more mature. This is very interesting. The histological images demonstrate that impact of initial cell number on the organization and shape of the cells and uniformity and intensity of the GAG matrix is affected. So you see here, when we change the initial cell number, not only the production is changing, but also the uniformity and intensity of the glycosaminoglycan and protoglycans. So the first, the very first idea we had was that maybe this phenomena is due to deficiency in the nutrition diffusion in the bigger pellet. Also, additionally, hypoxia plays a very important role in progression of chondrogenesis. So we thought that maybe the optimal chondrogenesis occurs in the pellet where there is a proper balance between hypoxia and nutrition diffusion. So you have enough number of the cells to actually create hypoxic environment, but also they are not too much that you can diffuse nutrition very easily. So we decided to ask for help from modeling scientists. I believe after so many years working in, in academia, I believe that big science happens when you have a lot of collaborators from different disciplines because they can bring ideas, technologies, and you know, all the stuff that you can use to make your science more meaningful. So Dr. Simon Tanaka from ETH Zurich helped us in this portion of the project. And he modeled our pellets and assessed the diffusion of TJ beta, glucose, and oxygen in our pellets. Interestingly, his modeling analysis showed that oxygen concentration at the center of the pellet is expected to be similar to the edge of the pellet with less than 10% differences observed in the case of the 500K pellet. So what we saw was actually the oxygen diffusion is not changing so much. This difference in oxygen concentration predicted for different uh, pellets do not constitute hypoxia, as even we have larger variations in human physiology. So likewise, the drop in the concentration of TGF beta was also predicted to be extremely negligible. However, his modeling data reported that the concentration of glucose is slightly lower in the pellets with a higher cell number. Nonetheless, the absence of any remarkable differences in the diffusion of oxygen and nutrition in the pellet with various initial cell numbers pointed us that maybe there are other mechanisms involved in the data which we are able to see. But you know, you have to always prove the modeling. In the next step, we try to prove the modeling data. So we stand for hypoxia inducible factor, which is called hyphen alpha and its expression is upregulated in hypoxic condition. As you see, immunohistochemistry images do not really show appreciable differences between different pellets. So you can see that in the pellets starting from 70K to 500K, the expression of hyphen alpha is not really changing dramatically. So in this stage, we know what is not responsible, but we needed to know what is actually responsible for what we see. So we decided to use Affymetrix genome analysis. I know it's expensive. I know it puts a lot of burden on the lab, but it's really worth it because you can really get a lot of information about your research. 
We use this affirmative gene array analysis to get more insight into the differences in the gene expression level in different conditions. So I, I isolated cells from different palettes, 48 hour post initiation of chondrogenic differentiation. And as you can see in the map, this special heat map shows top 100 differentially regulated genes as a function of changing the initial cell number within the palette. This affirmative gene array analysis showed us that the genes associated with chondrogenesis and endochondral ossification are upregulated in palettes with lower initial cell number, which is actually very good news because we also saw that in the palettes after cross-sectioning palette after day seven and day 21, we showed that the cells, the palettes with the in lower initial cell number actually show better chondrogenesis. So the diff upregulation of chondrogenic associated genes was quite expected. But what is interesting is that upon analysis of top 300 differentially regulated genes, we were able to find out that genes involved in regulation of lipid storage, such as caviolin 1, remember the name again, this is very important protein, interleukin 6, CD36, interleukin beta 3, and genes involved in regulation of lipid biosynthesis process and regulation of lipid transport such as leptin and salt-inducible kinase 1 were all down-regulated in palate with lower initial cell numbers. So we saw all these genes were down in 70K palate. Additionally, we also didn't see any significant differences in expression of hypoxia-associated genes such as hyphen alpha 1 and 3 between MSCs from various initial cell numbers, which also it was a, it was a good com it also confirmed our modeling data. So until now, we had a hint. Mm. And that our hint was the lipid storage. So let's keep on working on that. There is a strong evidence that the mechanical properties of cells can contribute to fate choices. The mechanical property of the cell is determined by different cellular components, such as plasma membrane and cytoskeleton. It has been suggested that presence of cholesterol and polysaturated fatty acids in the lipid bilayer increases the cell stiffness. We have shown in our own lab recently that lipid transfer alters cell plasma membrane lipid bilayer composition, and this impacts the deformability of the cell membrane. Since several genes associated with lipid transfer and lipid storage were downregulated in palettes with lower initial cell number, the 70K and 150K, we investigated if these differences at the gene expression level is translated into changes in the stiffness of the cell. This is very, very exciting. I and mean, if there was a work, we just hit a jackpot. So we decided to ask for help from Dr. Oliver Otto, who has recently developed a new technology to assess the mechanical properties of thousands of cells in less than a minute. This fascinating technique is called real-time deformability cytometry. It works based on hydrodynamic deformation of cells, translocating through a macrophilitic channel in a contact-free manner. And how cool is that? RTGC is able to analyze more than 100 cells per second in real time. So to do the, to this experiment, we almost have to actually travel across Germany. We are living in Freiburg, which is in southwest of Germany, and Dr. Oliver Lotto was actually, I mean, he is actually currently in Greifswald, which is northeast. So we travel across the country to analyze our samples. But believe me, it's definitely worth it. I think. Before going through the data I obtained using RTDC, it's better to describe a little bit how, did, how we did the experiment. So first, I digest my pellets and collagenase to get the single cell suspension. Then we analyze the cells using RTDC. Our data shows that cells extracted from 70K pellets are bigger than the cells extracted from the other pellets, which is actually also was able to, we were able to show this data in our histological images as you, as i told you before the cells are more mature and as chondrocytes become more mature the size also increases and there is a di and then also rtgc shows uh, showed us that there is a direct relationship between decreasing the initial cell number in the palate and increasing the cell size but more interestingly the cells extracted from 70k palate were less deformable than any other cells extracted from other conditions. So, Dr. Oliver Otto also helps us to analyze the elastic modulus of the cells. And as you can see in the bar graph, 
by decreasing initial cell membrane deposits, the elastic modulus is increasing. And this trend is even more appreciable, appreciable at day seven of chondrogenic differentiation. So you can see the trend by decreasing cell number of increasing elastic modulus of the cells even in day two, but the trend become more significant, more and more clear by day seven of chondrogenesis. This was very interesting data. We were very, very we were very encouraged by to it. Uh, encouraged, in, we were very encouraged by it, so we decided to take a look at the expression of mechanosensing proteins with a known role in a chondrogenic differentiation. So we saw that, okay, the cell mechanic is changing, let's look more toward the proteins. In order to ascertain the mechanical underpinning the regulation of chondrogenesis, because of this difference in initial cell number, we investigated that ex the expression of proteins involved in cell-cell contact. One of the proteins known to inhibit cell cell contact is carrier one. It's a main scaffolding protein residing in cholesterol rich, uh, cholesterol rich membrane microdomains, which has a documented role in mechanical transduction, and it's also implicated in transduction of mechanical forces across cell cell junction via stretch activated channels. This was the same protein which I mentioned to you before that you should remember the name. Carrioli have been implicated in the compartmentation and regulation of many signaling events such as MS3, renewal and differentiation to the adipogenic and osteogenic differentiation. If you look at the West Nambulite data, you will see that expression carrioli 1 inversely correlated the initial cell number within the palate and chondrogenic potential of the cells. In contrast, and carrier expression showed a completely opposite trend with pellets with lower initial cell number already showing appreciable expression by day two, which after seven days was two to three fold higher compared to high initial cell number conditions, implying that, that increasing initial cell number during MSC aggregation has a negative impact on it and in carrier expression and stabilization. So we were able also to show a similar trend with the immunofluorescent staining. As you can look at the cross-section image of the palette, the expression of carriolin one in red color is stronger in palette with higher cell number, and it's localized in the area with the less chondrogenic potential. However, expression of encadering is stronger in aggregates with lower cell number, and its expression is absent in the area with less chondrogenic potential within the palette with higher initial cell number, like 500K and 250K. The interesting inverse relationship between these two proteins, actually, which are which have a role in mechanical trans transduction, provide evidence for us and for others to investigate to opposing mechanobiology mechanisms responsible for directing chondrogenesis in mesenchymal stem cells. I believe curiosity is the reason behind all the big discoveries. In this stage of project, I was interested to know also, which signaling molecules are, are involved in this phenomenon? Another important actor in mesenchymal differentiation is beta catenin. It's a transcription co activator of canonical bind pathway. And you know, canonical bind pathway is the role in, in mesenchymal biology, developmental biology, and the formation of lung bones and cartilage are quite well established. So, I decided to look deeper in the role of beta catenin signaling. To investigate this, I made aggregates using mesenchymal stem cells transfected with commercially available SHRNA, which is called 7TGC. It's, uh, it's, I think, the very first paper was published in PLOS One. You can um, buy and you can, it's commercially available, so you can buy this plasmid. And this plasmid is stably expressed beta catenin TCF reprocer. And uh, I tried to uh, transfect my cells and analyze them by full cytometry for beta catenin transcription activity in different time points. Transfected MSC in the absence of nuclear beta catenin express only red fluorescent protein. However, alpha beta catenin binding to TCF LEF green fluorescent protein expression is induced in the cells. Surprisingly, cells in the palate with lowest initial cell number showed a threefold increase in the percentage of GFP positive cells on the second day of differentiation. And at day seven of differentiation, it was already increased by the fivefold. This intriguing finding, which correlates well with encadenin expression pattern, provides evidence for us that mesenchymal stem cell in the condensation phase, which means up to seven days, the cytoplasmic domain of encadenin interacts with beta catenin, so it makes stable catenin catenin complexes, which then leads to translocation of beta catenin inside the nuclei and it starts in signaling cascades. The absence of such differences also in 
day 21. So as you look at the data at day 21, you will see that there is no differences in beta catenin expression as beta catenin signaling. And that means, uh, it's, it, which is consistent with the maturation of chondrogenesis process at the end, because after 21 days, you know, all the cells were mat almost mature. The data obtained using genetically modified cells also needs to be confirmed using wild type cells. So what I did, I used immunofluorescent staining and I used, I stand for beta catenin in different stages of chondrogenesis. And as you see, in the 70K palette, we have nuclear uh, translocation of beta catenin to the nuclei, which is not actually absorbed in the palette of 500K. So the big question comes now, if this is all about cell-cell interaction, then this phenomena should happen even in absence of chondroinductive factors. So if I say this is only cell-cell interaction, if this is autonomous, it should not depend on whatever you have inside your medium. So what I decided to do, then to answer this question, I removed TGF beta out of my equation. So I removed TGF beta from my chondrogenic differentiation medium. At this very point, I was able to see that even in absence of such a strong chondroinductive factor, decreasing cell number increases MSCT chondrogenic potential. As you see, at, the, at day seven already, the 70K palette shows signs of chondrogenic differentiation, which by day 21 in the 70K palette, you, should, you see stronger expression of proteoglycans and also cell maturation. You can see with the white arrow I have shown how the cells are residing in lacuna in day, in day 21 of 70K and they are actually missing at, the, at uh, 500K at day 21. The cells are more con condensed together. They don't show any expression of proteoglycans in 500K, which is reversed with 70K. So as I see this experiment showed so to me, this is this process is definitely autonomous. So the next question was how we can employ this finding in tissue engineering and regenerative medicine. Because as I told before, my motivation was one of the my one of the my main motivation was osteoarthritis. In the bone and cartilage tissue engineering, you know the problem is the biggest problem is acquiring sufficient number of the cells for in vitro culture and in vivo implant implantation because it's costly, it's time consuming, and actually this step becomes a rate limiting step for clinical translation. Because you know, if you want to get, if you want to have sufficient number of mesenchymal stem cells, that means you actually need to passage them massively inside the lab. That means you put them through the culture for a long time. And MSCs have shown that if they stay in the culture for a long time, if you pattern them more frequently, they will lose their chondrogenic potential. So in the expense of losing MSC chondrogenic potential, you can actually increase the expansion time, which is not really efficient for tissue engine and regenerative medicine. And to address this issue, we investigated if implanting few the pellets with a lower cell number in the collagenase matrix will actually lead to superior outcome in comparison with traditional methodology of dispersing cells uniformly throughout the matrix. So as you know, the normal traditional cartilage tissue engineering or any tissue engineering, you disperse, you disperse um, mono, more, you disperse uh, single cell suspension in the, in the scaffolds or in your biomaterials. But what I try to do instead of doing that, I make my pellets before, yes, and then I implant this pellet laser inside the cartilaginous matrix. So after two, two days keeping the pellets in the culture, I implanted four of my 70K aggregates inside this collagenous matrix. While in the control condition, I had one million mesenchymal stem cells. And if you wonder why one million because one million is kind of a gold standard number for this four millimeter diameter collagenous matrix which are available you can commercially buy them after three weeks of chondrogenic differentiation what i saw that if the cells within the uh, palace were fully mature hypertrophic chondrocytes and were incorporated in the matrix and they deposited actually the tissue which is highly homogeneous but you know, you have to remember that the fact that the total cell number within this pellet condition is almost four times less than what is happening in traditional condition, which is in the control. However, they were able to produce very uniform matrix. You can actually see that um, that uh, presence of putting this uh, 
70k pellets actually inhibited the formation of hypoxia and necrotic zone, which occurs through the diminished oxygen nutri nutrition diffusion in such a large construct. You know, when you have a construct with four millimeter diameter, you should expect that you will have a, a nutrition diffusion problems and also oxygen diffusion problems. Actually, this finding validated the premise of our study and demonstrated the framework for, a, for potential trans, uh, translational applications. So, with this, um, with this slide, I would like to conclude what I have talked about till now. So, shortly, I would like to say induction of stable chondrogenesis from mesenchymal stem cells is crucial for CAR-T tissue engineering and, and, and bone regeneration using endochondral ossification paradigm. While significant effort has gone into optimizing culture conditions, serial expansion of cell in vitro for generating adequate cell number for manipulating comes at the expense of loss of chondrogenic potential. In this study, we developed a donor independent solution to address donor variability and loss of chondrogenic phenotype. We have demonstrated a direct relationship between the cell number during mes mesenchymal stem cell aggregation and their chondrogenic differentiation potential. Furthermore, we were able to show that uh, enhanced chondrogenesis correlates with the emergence of the stiffer mesenchymal stem cell phenotype, which is accompanied by regulation of proteins involved in metamtransduction, such as cavulin 1 and encadrin. And to excel the translation potential of our findings in the proof of concept study, we were able to demonstrate that the chondrogenesis is to, in which we were able to achieve with 70K pellet is superior to the conven conventional approach that can be achieved. And we can achieve this by using fourfold less cell numbers. So our analysis also showed that the aggregate approach yields superior outcome by inhibiting the formation of necrotic zone and increasing efficiency of mosaic deposition. The result of our study provides compelling evidence for the role of cellular mechanics in chondrogenic differentiation of MSCs in 3D aggregates with implication for understanding the mechanism involved in esclerotogenesis and MSC-based regenerative therapies. So last but not the least, I would like to give a very, very big thank you. So the list starts with my professor and my advisor, uh, Professor Prasad Chassi for all the time supporting me and my ideas and also paying for my research. Uh, Dr. Oliver Otto for doing experiments using RTDC, Dr. Simon Tanaka for his support with the modeling analysis and all the members of current members and previous members of Chassi Lab, which they provide an amazing environment to work and have fun. And uh, also, I would like to thank all the funding agencies, Health Most Visual Institute of Multifunctional Biomedicals for Medicine, the Excellence Initiative of German Federal State Governments, and the Swiss National Foundation's major grant, who were uh, generously supported my research. And last but not the least, I would like to thank GIPCO's Cell Culture team for providing me an opportunity to discuss my research in such a nice platform. So thank you so much for listening, and so the talk is open for questions. Thank you, Dr. Saram, for your informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of our webinar. Now, if you haven't started submitting your questions, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen and click Send. We'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. Okay, we've got some great questions coming in. Let's start at the top. Dr. Saram, how many donors did you use to generate the data? Uh, yeah, that's a really nice question. Actually, we used three donors, two male and one female with the age range between 25 to 50. Um, the data I presented now are from the male donor from age of 26, but you can also look at the other donors, uh, for example, for the female 50, which I have in the supplementary information of the article online. Now, I hope have that answered your question. <laughs> Yes, it has. And if you have additional questions regarding this answer, please feel free to submit them. Now let's go to our next question. Could we use the same protocol with urine-derived MS stem cells? Mm, that is one nice one. Actually, you know, urine-derived stem cells are kind of a new research topic, I think, in the last 
less than a decade or so they have been popular. I have seen some articles discussing their chondrogenic potential, and I believe if they have a chondrogenic potential, then they should, this protocol should work with them. As you know, the same protocol we have derived, we have used for adipose drive mesenchymal stem cells, and we got a similar outcome. So I believe these cells should not be also different if they show proper chondrogenic potential. <clears throat> Dr. Saran, have you checked apoptosis rate? Uh, actually, in the article, we have not really directly looked at the apoptosis, but we have looked for surviving, which is the apoptosis inhibitor protein. So I didn't present the data here because I thought it would maybe make it a bit more complicated and time consuming. But if you look at the article online, we will see that we will stain, we use immunofluorescent staining, we stain for surviving. And uh, we were able to show that actually uh, the expression of surviving is upregulated in the uh, palate with, init with lower initial cell number. So places which we have high chondrogenic potential, we had also higher expression of the surviving. More interestingly, I would also say that we saw inverse relationship between caviolin one expression and the surviving. So in the, for example, the palate with the higher initial cell number, we saw decrease of surviving expression and ex higher expression of cavalion 1, which means that, of course, it, it could not directly look at apoptosis, but it shows that the expression of uh, surviving when higher, the rate of apoptosis should be lower. Also, we looked for the proliferation rate, and we also saw high proliferation rate in the palate with the lower initial cell number, like 70K or 150K. Let's go to our next question. What do you see as the next step in understanding the mechanistic underpinnings? And my next question, where do you see this being applied? Oh, you know, I always like this uh, future outlook question. As I mentioned in art in the, in the talk, we had looked for several mechanistic transduction proteins, for example, caviolin 1 and cadherin and etc. You know, the role of caviolin 1 in MSD chondrogenesis is really not known. We were the very first one who discovered role of caviolin in MSC chondrogenesis. And we are actually currently trying to understand the temporal regulation of caviolin 1 during MSC chondrogenesis and how knockout or knockdown of caviolin 1 could impact MSC chondrogenesis. This is basically the direction we are currently trying to go. And uh, as I said in the beginning, our main, um, uh, main um, target is stem cell therapy, stem cell based regenerative medicine. And we are seeing this, uh, the use of this application in a bone tissue engineering and cartilage tissue engineering. I hope this Thank answered you. your question. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Saram. Now we'll go to our next question. What is the mm -hmm. advantage of using RTDC technique as compared to other techniques? As you know, um, if you know the RTDC is actually a technique which is used, used, is used for understanding the cell mechanical property. The other technique which has been used for, I would say, more than a decade is AFM, which is atomic force microscopy. With atomic force microscopy, you have to spend hours and days to sit on the machine and be able maybe to measure 10 cells. So you will be able to measure 10 cells after days, and you will have a very small population to analyze. And if you have like heterogeneous population of mesenchymal stem cells, uh, I wish you luck for analyzing with MSD, uh, with uh, AFM, but with RTDC, you can actually measure thousands of cells. So, for example, if you look at the article or the data I presented now, we have looked for more than 1,000 cells which are being analyzed. And then you load your sample, you analyze, and the process takes less than a minute. So the, the, the time that you load your samples, by the time you finish the measurement, it may be, I don't know, three to four minutes for 1,000 cells. And um, afterward, of course, analysis takes some time, but it's not also as time consuming as AFM. So I would say you will have a huge population to look after, and also you will have uh, better statistics, which will help you uh, to understand um, uh, you know, the heterogeneity of the population. Uh, I think actually there was a, the main publication from Dr. Oliver Otto's group, which were published in Nature Methods, if I'm not mistaken, that also clearly shows what advantage this machine has and how you can use this to understand not only the 
population of MSCs, but also cells from blood. That is very interesting. I would recommend you to look at the paper. It, it is really fascinating technology. And you can buy the machine also. It's available to purchase, I guess. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Srem. Now, mm -hmm. have you ever done embryonic stem cell-based cell fate analysis based on matrix properties? Uh, actually not. We have not looked with embryonic stem cells, but as I said, for this um, for this very specific project, we use adults derived mesenchymal stem cells. And I have a few questions that are asking about your Instagram account. Could you share your Instagram? Uh, you can look at my Instagram account. It's called Lady in Science. I am very, very delighted to share my journey in this account, and uh, I show, I share some, you know, scientific stuff, some the daily life of a female scientist. And I would really be happy to join to see you there. It's called Lady in Science. <laughs> you can even be able to find me with the hashtags. <laughs> Yes, and you can also click on the biography tab at the top of your screen. Um, Malika, Dr. Sarem's Instagram and her LinkedIn are listed there that you can connect with her as well. Okay, let's go to our next question. Are mm -hmm. there any changes to mechanosensitive ion channels like piezo-1 and piezo-2 as they were implicated in chondrocyte mechanosensation? And uh, that is a really interesting question because, you know, my supervisor, Professor Shastri, actually discovered the role of piezo-1 in mechanical transduction in, in neurons. So we actually, when I was doing my, uh, my uh, PhD and afterwards my postdoc, I also looked for the role of piezo-1, specifically not piezo-2, uh, on the role of MSC chondrogenesis. So uh, to be honest, we were not able to see huge differences. Uh, in 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 the role of piezo one in a mesenchymal stem cell based chondrogenesis, at, at least in the experiments that I did, also in our affirmative screenary analysis, we were not able to spot piezo one with the meaningful differences. So yeah, I mean, I would say. We did affirmative screenary at day two, and we look at the expression system after seven days of chondrogenesis and 14 days of chondrogenesis. But I believe that uh, maybe an earlier time point, much earlier, could play any could play some role. But our analysis didn't show any meaningful differences, at least in the time point that I discussed. Thank you, Dr. Saran. Now we're getting so many great questions coming in. If we Run out of time for your questions. Just a reminder that Dr. Saram will answer your questions via email following the presentation. We have time for a few more. Dr. Saram, what was the passage number that you used for the study? Um, that the passage number is actually great deal in MSC biology and MSC based regenerative therapies. We were very lucky to be able to use passage two. So we passage twice on mesenchymal stem cell in vitro, and then we use them for all culture. I would say recommend to use of mesenchymal stem cell up to passage four, but after that I would not use it because normally they use their differentiation potential after passage four. Did you test for trilineage differentiation potential of MSCs? Yes, of course. You know, when you use MSCs, you have to test them for trilineage differentiation. We tested them for osteogenic, chondrogenic, and adipogenic differentiation. Dr. Strand, do you think higher number of cells could have induced oxidative stress in the cells? Um, could be. You know, um, this uh, I remember when I, we had this paper on the review, we also got similar questions from one of the reviewers talking about oxidative stress. But uh, uh, to be honest, we didn't see any genes associated with oxidative, any differences in oxidative any differences in the in the genes associated with the oxidative interest in our affirmative gene array. Um, and also, you know, as I mentioned before, we didn't see much of a difference in oxygen diffusion in our um, in our samples. But uh, of course, uh, to be further studies, maybe more other more elaborating experiments can be done and it could be discussed more. But we didn't see anything in affirmative gene array we did after t two days of Conagenic differentiation. Thank you, Dr. Saram. Now we have time for a few more. Did you see differences in expression for fibronectin? Uh, 
Uh, that was a good question. Actually, we looked at carbon acting expression in the fibrillar state and also in extracellular matrix state. So I developed a assay in our lab, like ELISA assay for fibrin acting for the for the uh, basically soluble fibrin actin. The protocol how to use ELISA is also clearly described in the mask. You can go and develop it in your lab. It costs really less and it's really it's easy to do. So we actually looked at, as I said, both soluble and uh, fibrillar, fibrillar fibrinectin for the fibrillar we used western blood and we were able to see actually in the palace with a lower initial cell number which is this 70k and 150k we have higher expression of fibrinectin which is also you know could make sense because fibrinectin is related to chondrogenesis as all of you know and also it's on it's underpin of beta catenin expression so our uh, the fibrinectin expression was also confirming the data from the beta catenin upregulation up in uh, palace with a lower initial cell number. Doctor, a lot of questions. Doctor, <laughs> yes, great questions coming in. We have time for maybe two more. Did you see any differences in proliferation of MSCs? Um, actually, yes. So uh, this comes, uh, um, you know, if, if you remember, I discussed in the modeling data that we saw differences in a glucose uh, glucose diffusion in between lower initial cell number pellets and pellets with a higher initial cell number. So um, we saw that the pellets with a higher initial cell number have almost uh, like they, they were, our modeling showed that they predicted to be half of what is in the media, which is around 2.2 milligram per ml. Uh, but yeah. And there was, but in the lower lower initial cell number pilots, we didn't see these differences. But you know, glucose is a small molecule, so the only factor that can alter its diffusion behavior is consumption rate. Because of that, we started to examine the proliferation instead of mesenchymal stem cells, as I mentioned before. So we looked at proliferation capacity of MSCs, and we were able to actually see that MSCs within MS, I mean, they are differentiated already. In the lower initial cell number pilots, we're actually showing high proliferation rate uh, in comparison to the uh, cells from higher initial cell number. So when you look at the proliferation rate of the pellets uh, from higher initial cell number, we actually saw the number of cells are con is remained almost constant. However, in pellets with a higher initial cell number, we saw dramatic increase almost fourfold after 21 days, which is very interesting because, you know, we have also previously shown that hypercellular cartilage is basically a, a, a way to go for engineering cartilage in vivo. Uh, yeah, and also the data you can uh, you can see clearly. I mean, the, the data we have presented clearly in the manuscript. So if you want to get more information about the proliferation rate or uh, understanding how we use which methodology we use to to look at the proliferation proliferation rate of mesenchymal stem cells, I would recommend you to look at the article online. Thank you, and we'll end with this final question. You mentioned that there is a slight difference in glucose diffusion. Could you please elaborate on that a bit? Uh, yeah, this was actually what I mentioned a little bit before. So uh, as I said, this glucose is quite a small molecule. So, you know, for glucose the difference in glucose diffusion can only be coming from, you know, higher consumption rate. And higher consumption rate comes from, you know, proliferative status of mesenchymal stem cells or any cell type. Generally, mesenchymal stem cells, when they go through chondrogenic behavior, chondrogenic differentiation pathway, they decrease their metabolic activity. So they actually become less proliferate, uh, they become less, um, they consume, they decrease their consumption rate. But we, uh, to understand why the consumption rate of MSCs was increasing, or to to have higher glucose diffusion in a lower initial cell number pellets, we looked at, as I said, to the proliferation capacity of MSCs, and you are able to show that MSCs in a lower initial cell, or with the pellets with a lower initial cell number have higher uh, proliferation rate. So I would say this is a link between glucose diffusion and also MSC proliferation potential in lower initial cell number pellets. Thank you again, Dr. Saran. Do you have any final comments for our audience? Um, yes, I would like to thank everybody for joining here for the talk. I really, really enjoyed to discuss my research with you, and I learned a lot of interesting stuff from your questions. Um, 
I would really appreciate you if you have further questions to contact me either via my email or my Instagram account or Twitter. And I would also like to thank again the Gipco Cell Culture team for giving me such an opportunity. Thank you again. And thank you so much. And then, yeah. oh. <laughs> Very mm -hmm. good. Thank you again. And before we go, I'd like to thank our audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Just a reminder, questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. Again, I'd like to thank Dr. Malika Sarem for her time today and for her valuable research. We'd also like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, Thermo Fisher Scientific, for underwriting today's educational webcast. This webcast can be viewed on demand. LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, goodbye.